the Cavalcade of America. The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, tells how our nation has won leadership in many fields. Important among these is chemistry. Chemical research by developing new uses for the raw materials from American farms and mines and forests has created a great variety of products that contribute daily to your comfort and convenience. If you're interested in chemistry, you find something of value in a book that we have just prepared called The Kinship of DuPont Products. With this booklet is included a 13-color chemical chart which illustrates the interesting interrelationship of DuPont products. A copy may be obtained free of charge by writing DuPont, Wilmington, Delaware. We shall have more to tell you about this booklet and chart at the close of the program. The name Mark Twain is used on this program by special permission of the trustees of the Samuel L. Clemens Estate, the Mark Twain Company, and Harper Brothers Publishers, extended through Charles T. Lark, attorney for the estate. Our DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra sets our scene with two movements from Ferdy Grofe's Mississippi Suite, Father of Waters and Huckleberry Finn. Literature is an important index of a country's progress. Whether the work of its authors be critical or inspirational, their writings must furnish the guide to each succeeding generation on the customs, traditions, and ambitions of the race. It is 1845, 
near the small, sleepy village of Hannibal, Missouri. In that typical American village lives Sam Clemens, later to be called Mark Twain. As a small boy, he had his best time swimming in the Mississippi. Now, leaving his playmates behind, he swims far out toward the middle of the great river. Good old Mississippi. Hey, Johnny. Johnny, swim out here. Sam! You come on back closer to shore. Suppose you got a cramp. Oh, I'm all right. Look at those lumber barges coming. Then I can swim up to one. You be careful, Sam Clemens. Jip ahoy. Jip ahoy there. Who's that jip ahoy in me? Hey, hey, Mr. Lumberman. I'm getting tired. Grab a hold of the barge as I come by. That's right. Say, hey, you're a scrap to be swimming out in the middle of the Mississippi. I'm not so, not so little. Yeah. Grab my hand and I'll heist your boy. I, I got it. Up the daisy. There you are. Well, there ain't enough of you to make a tadpole. Well, there is, too. I'm growing on ten. Hey, he'll fine to be up on this barge. Oh, he's sweep along the water. Ain't you never been in a boat before, son? Not on a big one that could sweep along with a cart like this. He was. Johnny's way back there. You see that point of land ahead? We're sweeping in close to it, and you jump off there and swim. Mm. I'm going to carry you clear to Nolan. Hey, can't I stay on your barge a little longer, mister? Don't figure it better, son. Sure got spunk, though. Why don't you get a barge of your own? Who, me? You're going to grow up someday, aren't you? Yeah, reckon I am. But I always thought I'd like to be a pirate. <laughs> Pirates is getting uh, scarcer and hen's teeth, son. Uh, you better be a reverend. Yeah. Yes, maybe I will, mister. I sure like this old Mississippi. Well, let's see you swim to that point. Bet you can't make it before I'm up even that cliff ahead. Oh, that's easy. Thanks for the ride, mister. So long. So long. <laughs> Mighty spunky kid. Small Sam Clemens lived a typical American boy's life in a typical American small town. He wrote Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, which came to represent for millions of his countrymen their own memories of youth. He was in his middle 20s when he began fulfilling childhood ambitions. In 1856, in the pilot house of the Mississippi River Steamboat. Sam, you've been a good apprentice pilot now for two years. Are you certain you know this part of the river? Captain Bixby, I know it like the back of my hand. Oh, and then I'm going to let you take the ship across alone from this shore to the other one. Will you recommend me for my pilot's license afterwards? Well, we'll see. Hey, sir. Yes, Captain. Yes, Captain. You stay here in the pirate house with Mr. Clemens in case he wants to send me any messages on the trip. Yes, Captain. Afraid you don't trust me, Captain. Well, we'll see. I'll be on the lower deck half with the... Aces, do you think I'll look uh, fine in a pilot's cap? You gonna be a real for sure pilot, Mr. Clemens? Just as soon as it takes me to get from here to that other bank. And now, now stand back, Aces. Yes. Uh, I gotta give the sailing signal. We getting off smooth. Sure, wish I was going to be a river captain. Oh, watch how I steer, and that'll be less than one for you, Aces. Say, why doesn't that leadsman up in front take a sound? Well, I thought you knowed all the depth in this river, Mr. Clemens. Sure, I know the depth myself, but uh, I just like to hear him call him. Give me the sounding. Mark Twain. Mark Twain. Let's see, that means two fathoms, 12 feet. What? Why, it ought to be 40 feet right here. Uh, don't get excited, Mr. Clemens. Yes, but what's the matter? Uh, has the bottom shifted? It couldn't have since I was over at last. The leadsman on the port side now going to give a sound, and maybe that'll be better. Four feet! Four feet? Oh, my heavens, we'll be aground. Back this year. Oh, it's too late. Uh, run for Captain Bixby. Uh, what's the matter, Sam? A little trouble here? Oh, we were heading for a bank, Captain, but now we're, we're sailing right on. Well, how deep ought it to be right here? 80 feet. But the leadman said four feet. Well, 
I told the leadman to call the wrong depth. You see, Sam, you lose your head. Until you learn how to keep it, you can't be a river pilot. Oh, I feel mighty silly. You ought to. Well, anyway, I'm not discouraged, Captain. I know every inch of this river. All I got to do now is know my own mind. Sam Clemens won his license and became a skillful river pilot. But he was forced to leave the Mississippi when the Civil War ended its steamer traffic. In 1861, in Virginia City, Nevada, Sam Clemens stands politely at the door of Mr. Goodman, editor of Virginia City's newspaper. Uh, Mr. Goodman? Oh, hello there, stranger. What do you want? Well, I've been walking about 60 miles to get here, uh, covered with dust. Reckon the first thing I want is a brush. <laughs> brush, eh? Yeah. Well, I guess you can use ours. Hanging right beside you on the wall. Oh, thanks a lot. Damn. <laughs> There's enough dirt on me to choke a horse. <laughs> Look at it, would you? Anything else we can supply you with? Well, I'm trying to think. Maybe about two pound sirloin steaks and mashed potatoes and about half an apple pie. Say, you've got enough brass to go far in the world, stranger. Afraid we can't go on acting like a hotel. This is a newspaper. Sure, I know it. I'm sure I'm going to like working for it. Working for it? What makes you think you're going to work here? Why, you want a calmness, don't you? A good reporter. I especially want to write stuff that can give people a good laugh. Most of them need one. You don't say. I've even picked out my name. Mark Twain. Uh, that's river language. It's what the legend calls out for a two-fathom sounding. I had an experience as a river pilot once that certainly impressed the term Mark Twain on my memory. Well, I'd like to hear more about your career, Mr. Twain. But the truth is, I've got a newspaper to put out. And a lily-livered coyote who was supposed to show up here hasn't come. Well, aren't you going to hire me? Why in the name of Pete should I? But you you wrote me a letter asking me to come here. I had to walk all the way. I'm done in. You wrote me... Say, what's your real name? Sam Clemens. Well, that's different, Mr. Clemens. Shake hands. <laughs> well, say, you gave me a scare. I reckon I forgot to tell you my real name when I came in. I, yeah, I'm sort of absent-minded. Why, everybody in Virginia City is spreading their sides laughing over the stories you've been in. Uh, wait till I get some sharp pencils for you. Now, uh, what do you like to write on best? A sirloin steak. <laughs> that copy boy! Over at the two-star hash house... Get a steak the size of a steer. <laughs> Thus, young Sam Clemens became Mark Twain writer. Americans were to appreciate the privilege of seeing their booming West through such a book as Roughing It. They heaped their ready praise on this new and original writer. But young Mark Twain was to face a more critical and alien audience. In 1873, backstage in a London lecture hall, Mr. Dolby, you're a good manager. We have a big audience, but I can't talk tonight. But what are you afraid of, Mr. Twain? You've given hundreds of talks in the United States. I've seen your press notices. Well, I was talking to a lot of roughnecks like myself who knew my language. But picture the impudence of trying to make an English audience understand an American joke. Mr. Twain... You can't disappoint this audience. They've, they've all come to hear more jokes like the one about Cotton Umbrella. The, the what? Well, don't you remember what you said a fortnight ago to an Englishman who laughed at your American habit of carrying a cotton umbrella? Well, what did I say? Well, you said Americans carried cotton umbrellas because they were the only kind an Englishman wouldn't steal. Good heavens. Well, then I've insulted people. No, no, Mr. Twain. London loves that story. Begging your pardon, Mr. Dolby, sir, but ain't it time to turn up the lights? The audience is restless. Tompkins, for the love of heaven, tell Mr. Twain that people read his books in England. Why, Mr. Twain, the Olympic Cycle and Reading Club, what I belong to, is taking up your work special. Do you read them? Why, I'm in the middle of Innocence Abroad. <laughs> so many of those things you sign, I often stop myself. <laughs> Makes me laugh. You see, Mr. Twain, you're universal. And if you want to go on stage for the sake of your country, if nothing else. My country? Well, what's my country got to do with this? Because here in England, we can match your polite intellectual artists every way. But there are three personalities that Englishmen today can't hear enough about. 
Abraham Lincoln, Artemis Ward, and yourself. Let me go on and announce it. No, no, no. I'll go on stage myself right now uh, while I'm able. Good heavens, Mr. Delby. He's walking right out without no introduction. Let me get to them live. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Twain had fully expected to be here this evening. Wow. And to tell the truth, he is here. And will now give his lecture entitled, Our Fellow Savages of the Sandwich Isles. <laughs> Mark Twain brought to Americans a better knowledge of their country. In England, in Europe, and even in the distant Orient, his books or translations of them brought a better understanding of American ways to her neighbors. Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, moves on. In 1842, in Concord, Massachusetts, young Louisa May Orchid plays with the village children in Ralph Waldo Emerson's barn. Thus, Roderick, are you punished for your terrible wickedness. <laughs> oh, I feel. I just ran into it with my sword. I know, Louisa May. Well, I got the giggle. Oh, well, we keep still so Louisa can finish her scene. It's marvelous. Go on, Louisa. But what awful fate has made me slay my own brother? Better if we had both fallen off this cliff and into the sea below it. Don't pace up and down so close to the edge of the hayloft, Louisa. Yes. Oh, dark and roaring waves. Perhaps I should leap from this cliff. Don't jump that high, Louisa. Oh, Louisa, look up. Oh, Louisa. Right on her head. Oh, Louisa. What did you yell for? I'm all right. Aren't you hurt a bit? Well, a little. That was an awfully high cliff. Children. Children. Did I hear a scream out here? Well, Mr. Emerson, Louisa was acting one of her plays and she fell on her head. Oh, Ellery, you and Margaret should be running home. I heard your mother calling you for supper. I'll take care of Louisa. Thanks, Uncle Ralph. Bye, Louisa. Hope you feel better. Oh, poor child. How does it feel now? Better. Could could I use one of your handkerchiefs, please? Oh, there you are. Come on out here, where we can sit down under the apple tree. I uh, I came out specially to ask about your mother. Oh, she's all right. She's lonesome sometimes because she misses Papa. All of us do. Will he come back from London soon, do you think, Mr. Emerson? Well, either he'll come back or else he'll found his new school successfully over there and we'll send for you to London. Would you like that? Oh, I'd love to see other countries. But I don't think I ever will. We're too poor. Oh, don't feel that, Chuck. Yes, but we are, though. I heard two ladies talking after church one day. And one said, Bronson Orchid's just a dreamer. Can't even take care of his wife. And those four little girls. Concord is a very gossipy town, Louisa. Most towns are. But it might be true. Maybe that's why Mommy works so terribly hard and still. Sometimes we don't have enough to eat. That's what I wanted to know. Let me know when that happens, will you, Louisa? Will you promise? Yes, sir. I worry about my Mommy. I know she works till it isn't good for her. Help her all you can, Louisa. I mean to. No. How is your bump, child? Why, it's all gone. At least I've forgotten it. You're learning to be brave, Louisa. Always forget your own hurts in the ills of others. Well, I must go in, child, because Mrs. Emerson has supper ready. Uh, but uh, please take your mother this book to read. Oh, thank you, sir. Has it pictures? I think so. Good night, Louisa. And don't forget to run home before dark. I won't. Louisa! Uh, there's your sister Anna calling. Good night, Louisa. Louisa! Good night. Oh, oh, here you are. Mommy's at supper time. What are you staring at? Mr. Emerson put a $10 note for us in this book. Oh, Anna, isn't he a good man? As young Louisa May grew up, 
She found inspiration in such neighbors as the Emersons and the Hawthorns. At 19, she sold her first story for $5. But her writing had to be interspersed with other work, as a paid companion, as a governess, and as a seamstress. One particularly hard winter, when Mrs. Alcott, Louisa May, and her younger sister Betty had gone to live in Boston, in the front room of their small flat, Louisa finishes a fitting for one of her dressmaking customers. I hope you surely have my dress finished by Thursday, Miss Alcott. Sometimes you're slow. I know, Mrs. Sanford. Mother's faster. I'll, I'll ask her to help me with it. Well, just so it's in some shape to wear. Uh, where did I put that magazine I was carrying? Why, why, here it is, under your veil. Oh, what's the matter? You jumped like it did you. Oh, nothing but... Well, I have a story in this magazine. A story? You? Yes, I, I sometimes write silly little things. But this is a continued story. See? Here it is. What? Well, I don't believe you. Well, I didn't mean to talk about it. I'm not proud of it, goodness knows. But here's the next chapter I'm just writing. Let me see. Why, Miss Alcott, I, I never dreamed. Oh, I adore this story. If this is really the next chapter, could I take it home? Oh, I'm afraid not, Mrs. Sanford. I, I have to send it in tomorrow. Why, too amazing. My own dressmaker. Well, I don't see how you get into it. Well, I think up the plots while I'm sewing, and then I write on Saturdays and Sundays. You want to give all your time to writing. Sometime when I have money enough, I will. Oh, you, you want the dress by Thursday. I remember. Oh, oh, not if it puts you out too much. I mean, I am more anxious to find out what happens to your splendid hero. He's too divine. Good day, Miss Austin. Don't work too hard. Good day, Mrs. Sanford. Oh, Louisa. Oh. Louisa. Wait a minute, Betty. I'll be right in, dear. And Betty, what do you think? I've met my public at last. It's that big fat Mrs. Sanford. Oh, she thinks my trash is too divine. Betty, what's the matter? Oh, I got into bed because I felt weak again. Oh, don't look so scared, dear. But you've been crying. Why, Betty? Because I, I couldn't fix supper for you and Mommy. Oh, Betty, why, Mother and I are both as strong as horses. We can fix our own meals. It's wicked for you to cry about such nonsense. It's only lately I've grieved that I couldn't have done more help. When I'm gone... Gone? Oh, I didn't mean to say that. But you know how you were always lining us up and making us promise to look after Mommy. Louisa, I'm... I'm seeing my share of that promise back to you. I'll keep it, dear. Whatever happens, you're not to worry. Betty Alcott died, and Louisa grieved deeply. But personal sorrow, poverty, and unceasing hard work never dimmed for Louisa Alcott the goal she had set herself to attain. In 1868, in the Alcott's living room at Concord, young Julian Hoffman, son of the famous novelist, May Alcott, and her older sister Louisa talked together. May is speaking. Oh, Louisa turned intellectual. Oh. All she does is scribble, scribble, scribble. Is this the manuscript? Hmm? Let me see it. Oh, now, put that down, Julian Hoffman. Oh, let me look at now, it. Do you know who's around your father's manuscripts and read what he's written? Say, you're developing a temper. Oh. Isn't she pretty when she blushes? Oh, please, Julian. If you'll put that manuscript down, I'll tell you why I'm so concerned about it. I'm waiting for a letter from the publisher I've sent it to. What? You've sent it already? Mm. And you never told us. Oh, Mommy. Oh, Mommy knows it. She's the only one I have told. Oh, Louisa. You'll be famous someday, I'm sure. Oh. Look here. Here's a good scene about a picnic. It sounds just like the picnics we've had in Concord. What, what are you going to call it, Louisa? Little Women. Little Women? Louisa. Oh. Louisa. Yes, Mother. A letter for you from Boston. Is it the letter? Perhaps you'd best open it upstairs, Chuck. Oh, I've, I've told May and Julian about it, Mommy. I, I may as well open it here. Louisa, don't oh. be too disappointed. If oh, read it, Louisa. What do you say? Wait a minute. I, he thinks the opening chapters are dull. Well, so do I. But he thinks it seems wholesome. A good girl's book. He's taken it. Oh, oh you'll publish it. Oh, oh, oh I'm so glad. Congratulations, oh. Arthur. <laughs> My dear, you don't need to be told how glad your mother is. And the best part of it's knowing you've done it all yourself. Oh, no, Mommy. You've helped. And May. And Betty. And everyone. Because all of us have lived this book. 
If it succeeds, that will be the reason why. Louisa Alcott was a valiant spirit who endured until she had won her goal. The success of Little Women gave to her family the comfort she had long desired for them. But to other Americans, it gave much more. The same sense of remembered experience they had found in Mark Twain. The lasting fame of our popular authors testifies to the honored place of literature in the cavalcade of America. has often been called an age of chemistry. Man is no longer satisfied with things as they are found in nature, so chemists take nature's raw materials and change them into forms better suited to human needs. In exploring nature's secrets, chemists have discovered certain raw materials that rival Aladdin's lamp in the wonders they contain. Would you ever suspect that my lady's lovely evening gown might be first cousin to the safety glass in your car? or that the colorful lacquer you used on that old chair has anything in common with the photographic film which brings to the screen your favorite movie star. Although they seem unrelated, the products just mentioned are really sisters under the skin. How these and other chemical products are related to each other is told in a booklet we have just printed. It is called The Kinship of DuPont Products and includes a chemical chart in 13 colors. We shall be glad to send a free copy to those of our listeners who believe it will be of value in their work or studies. This booklet and chart illustrate in a striking way the meaning of the phrase which guides DuPont chemists, better things for better living through chemistry. To avoid dis- uh, disappointing anyone, we wish to make clear that the booklet and chart entitled The Kinship of DuPont Products are not popular treatises on the romance of chemistry. They contain more or less technical information which will be of interest primarily to those who have studied chemistry or who use chemicals in their business. If you believe this booklet and chart will prove of interest to you, just write to Pont, Wilmington, Delaware. A copy will be sent you absolutely free of charge. Simply address DuPont, D-U-P-O-N-T, Wilmington, Delaware. Opportunity, a subject which includes some interesting stories of Benjamin Franklin, will be the title of the broadcast next week at this same time, when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.